Okay, thank you. So for our last speaker before the question and answer session with all the speakers, this is Dr. Alexander. He trained in psychiatry and cognitive behavioral therapy at the Institute of Psychiatry in the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, where he also obtained a PhD in health sciences. He's now professor of psychiatry at the School of Medicine and founder of the Research Center in Spirituality and Health. He's also chair of the World Psychiatric Association with the section on religion, spirituality and psychiatry. Dr. Alexander, welcome. We look forward to listening to you. Hello, good, uh, good morning or good afternoon. I think <laughs> your time there, I'm here in Brazil. Now is 9.46. It's a great pleasure being here. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And it's a great honor also talking just after my dear friend and colleague here from the Federal University of Juiz de Fora, from Lupes, Humberto Schubert Coelho. Well, uh, I will present very briefly in about half an hour uh, a book that recently was published. And the book was written by me, the friend Humberto, and also a psychiatrist, Mariana uh, Silva, uh, Mariana Costa, I'm sorry. And uh, in this book, we basically we investigate the science of life after death, if it is possible, and what is the evidence, the scientific evidence regarding life after death. Okay, so uh, it's interesting because the belief in the survival of the soul is very prevalent, widespread throughout cultures throughout ages. Basically, it is in the core of almost all religious and spiritual traditions. Basically, all religious traditions believe in some sort of surviving, survival of the soul, of consciousness, uh, wherever. And also, it also permeates the philosophy. For example, in Western philosophy, we can see several authors from Plato to Kant that investigates and discusses and accepts the idea of survival <clears throat> after death. However, it's often assumed that in our contemporary world, there is not a space, there is not room for this belief in afterlife. However, um, national surveys worldwide have proved otherwise. For example, <clears throat> excluding China and Russia, at least 6% of the population of the 10 most populous countries in the world believe in life after death. Even in the highly secularized Western Europe, 40% of Western Europeans believe that when people die, that is the end. There is no life after death. That means that less than half of Western Europeans accept the idea that there is no life after death. So most of West Europeans are open to this possibility. And also, contrary to many expectations, it's not, it has not been shown that uh, higher educational levels would induce lower levels of belief in afterlife. Actually, there are some evidence of the opposite. For example, studies in France, Russia, and in Brazil shows that people with higher levels of education actually do believe more in afterlife or in some sort of survival. So, uh, so it, it, seem, it shows that it is a belief that it has not disappeared on the opposite. It's very prevalent and is not... Uh, and also that the higher levels of education would not cause the, the, the reduction of this belief. And also this belief, uh, even if we uh, don't discuss if it is, it, there is an actual survival or not, it impacts 
mental health. Here we have some studies. Unfortunately, there are not many studies, but there are some studies that investigate the impact of afterlife beliefs or believe in some sort of survival, personal survival, survival of consciousness, and uh, mental health outcomes. For example, uh, findings uh, of several studies point that higher levels of belief in afterlife uh, are related to lower end-of-life despair, lower anxiety, lower suicide deaths, and euthanasia acceptance, lower psychiatric symptoms, and higher levels of life satisfaction. And there is also an implication of afterlife beliefs in a more broad worldview. For example, as it's shown here, higher levels in believing afterlife, it, it predicts lower belief in a cynical world and more belief in an equitable world, this leading to lower psychiatric symptoms. Okay? But despite uh, or in addition to this importance of this belief for religious traditions, for philosophy, and or also for mental health, what uh, a question, a big question is, is it possible to translate this philosophical and religion question, survival after death, in a scientific quest? And actually, yes, it is possible. About one century and a half ago, it started based in many different investigators, for example, in psycho research like the, the London Society for Psycho Research or the investigations of Alan Kardec, the investigations of many spiritualists and others started the attempt, the quest of making a scientific investigation of survival after death. And actually, uh, many of the most bright scientific and philosophical minds uh, on, for the period, for the last uh, 150 years, have been involved in this sort of investigation. However, most people are not aware of this. So this is exactly the purpose of our book, to present and discuss the best available empirical evidence of our survival of human consciousness after permanent bodily death. But before presenting the evidence, it's very important to clean the path to address the main arguments against survival. Because the, the, the idea, uh, there are several misguided philosophical and ideological prejudices that cloud a fair, rational analysis of the body of empirical evidence. Because if you believe upfront that it is impossible to have some sort of survival, you, 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 you would deny a priori any sort of evidence. So we need to discuss this previously. For example, there is a misguided assumption that neuroscience had proved, uh, has proved that the brain generates mind, that science shows that our consciousness are, is nothing but the chemical and electrical activity of our brain. And if the brain dies, or if the brain is not working, there cannot be any consciousness activity and personality or whatever it is. And some of the evidence that usually assumed as proving that mind, that brain generates mind is, for example, if you make some brain stimulation, we can generate, for example, hallucination sounds. We can see some correlations between mind activity, feelings, thinking, and brain activation. And also, if we make, for example, some damage in the brain, we can interfere and harm mind function. So some people jump to conclusions based on this evidence that it would prove that the brain generates mind. However, this is not so straightforward. Just to give an example, actually, the key founders of the modern scientific psychology, like William Wundt in Germany and William James in the United States, and founders of neuroscience, like Sir Charles Charenton, who created our concept of neurons and synapses that we have nowadays, and also Wilbur Penfield, from Canada, uh, also a very important neurosurgeon and neuroscientists. All of these 
major founders of scientific psychology and neuroscience, they were very aware of those previous evidence that we discussed. However, they did not hold physicalists' view of the mind. So it shows us that this evidence are not so straightforward as evidence for a physicalist perspective of human beings. Actually, they accept the idea that the brain can be an organ for limiting and determining to a certain form a consciousness elsewhere produced. In other words, the mind, the brain could be a, a tool or a filter for mind manifestation, not necessarily this ultimate source of mind. So this is an open question nowadays in mind, the brain problem and in science. And the second the most important aspect also that we say, second the most important misguided uh, assumption is that science uh, has proved physicalism, that there is only physical force and particles in the universe. And then survival after death would imply supernaturalism. So uh, first, it's important to show that the idea of physicalism, that everything is matter, physical force and particles, is not a scientific fact, it's a metaphysical assumption, it's a respectable one, but it's not a definitive fact, proven fact. And the second point, as I said previously, uh, it's, it's not correct that to do science, you must accept physicalism. Actually, the founders of modern science, like Galileo, Kepler, Newton, the founders of scientific psychology, the founders of neuroscience were not physicalists. And also, survival does not imply, imply denying the knowledge of science that we have nowadays. And uh, we, because we can have an enlarged concept of nature, some authors like Thomas Nagel, a British philosopher of mind, very prominent nowadays, published in a book, Mind and Cosmos, that was published at Oxford University Press a few years ago, that we could have an expanded nature, uh, expanded naturalism, because in this expanded naturalism, nature would be composed by physical particles, but also by consciousness. So you don't need to deny naturalism. You can expand naturalism to include also this other aspect. So, and also we discuss in the book other uh, misguided assumptions, but we don't have time to discuss them now. And now let's move to the most important part of my talk. That is exactly uh, what would be evidence for survival and if there is such evidence. So before discussing what is evidence for survival, what would be scientific evidence for survival, it's very interesting to understand how do we recognize each other as human beings. For example, Humberto is a close friend. We know each other for several years. And of course, for example, I, I, I know Humberto uh, about his memories, about his mannerisms, his personality, his personal style, okay? So, Humberto is characterized by a continuity of character and memory. Or every time that I meet Humberto, I expect a certain pattern of character and memory. But let's imagine if, for example, I have a terrible accident, car accident, and I have my body burned, but I survived, but I'm defigurated, disfigurated. So no one can recognize me anymore uh, based on my image in my body. And let's imagine that there is no DNA test. How Umbert or other friends uh, would be able, to, or my family, would be able to recognize that that disfigured body is Alexander. They will recognize me by the continuity of character and memory. If I show <clears throat> the memories that Alexander is expected to have, and if I show the character, the personality traits, the skills that I usually have, okay? The same thing, so what actually matters, as I'm emphasizing here, is not the body, it's the continuity of character and memory. And let's imagine if I had died in that accident, 
how my family, my friends would be able to recognize that I, as a consciousness, as a soul, as a spirit, has survived and been able to communicate. If I showed this continuity of character and memory. This is exactly what we need to look for. So <clears throat> they would look for memory, being able to remember facts in covering different topics, identifying people that I was acquainted to. If I had skills, for example, skills to speak in English, but not skills to speak in German, German, for example, or uh, artistic, I don't have any artistic <laughs> skills, but I appreciate arts very much. But I thought I don't have skills, uh, artistic, artistic skills. My handwriting, my personality traits, my temperament, my character, my personal style. This is what uh, someone would need to look for. Okay, let's move to see if there is this sort of evidence or not. So the first question is, are there scientific investigations on this so strange and weird topic, according to some people? Yes, actually, there are many. So this is a systematic review of the literature. We investigated one of the, the most respectable uh, databases in science, that is Web of Science, uh, where are... Uh, the main scientific journals in different areas. And we found, we looked for papers investigating experiences related to the possibility of consciousness beyond the brain. For example, investigate near-death experience, out-of-body experience, possession, mediumship, past life, so on and so forth. So we found almost 2,000 papers. This was five years ago. We find almost 2,000 papers on the subject, and also the impact factor that may measures in some sort the quality of the journals, uh, the impact factor of, this, of the journals that publish these papers are similar to the other more mainstream areas. So actually, there is a, a quite large body of studies on this, okay? So let's review <coughs> these, uh, <coughs> these main types of studies. We will concentrate here in <coughs> three different... <coughs> I'm sorry. We'll concentrate here in <coughs> basically three different experiences. Near-death and out-of-body experience, we are putting them together. Mediumistic experiences and reincarnation cases, case suggestives of reincarnation. So the out-of-body experience, of course, is suggestive in some sense, at least prima facie, uh, of some kind of independence of mind, of consciousness from the body. Since the person sees himself or for herself detached from the body, they can see their body, they can move around when the body, for example, is resting in a bed or so on and so forth. Of course, it can be illusion. It can be just a dream. But uh, th this is not the feeling that the person have, and we may have uh, also some other sorts of evidence. And this out-of-body experience also can happen in a very specific circumstance when the person is near death. And most interesting to our studies is when the person has a cardiac arrest. The cardiac arrest is very important for our studies because the brain needs a continuous supply of body, of blood, I'm sorry, of blood, bringing oxygen and glucose. Because the brain has no reserve of oxygen and glucose, and it consumes a lot of it. So what happens is when the, the blood flow stops, when the blood stops coming to the brain, the brain start, stops working in a few seconds, about 30 seconds, the brain, the brain becomes electrically flat with, with no electrical activity because it cannot work anymore. According to the physicalist perspective, this uh, cardiac arrest generating the this, this stop of blood flow in the brain causes the stop of neuronal functioning, electrical functioning, and then the consciousness should not exist if it is pro produced by the brain. However, people actually do 
claim do report very vivid experiences during these moments, often out of body experiences. So actually, in this, uh, they refer a very clear consciousness when the brain is severely damaged or not working at all. And what was very interesting, they report that these experiences were very real, and actually they feel it as more real than reality. There are some studies comparing uh, the quality of the memory during near-death experiences with the memory of actual events that happen in a person's life and also fantasies. The quality of the memory of near-death experiences are higher even than actual events in person's life, suggesting that it's not just fantasy. Another aspect, this difference, uh, differing from confusional states that are also common in intensive care units, for example, when the person recovers from a, a hallucinatory state or delusional states, uh, confusional states, intensive care units, usually they don't remember what happened or they realize that, oh, my mind was not working well, I was not fine, and things like that. But after the death experience, it's the opposite. They are very sure about the veracity of what, what happened. And also, they become very impacted in their lives throughout years. They see their physical body in different positions. Different cultures, different people in different places, different ages uh, report very similar core features. And it's not dependent of religious beliefs, educational level, fear of death, duration of cardiac arrest. Of course, it impacts, influences the content, but the core is very similar. It's not explained by hypoxia, uh, the loss of oxygen, because there are some cases of accidents with no influence on oxygen levels. And despite that, people have a near-death experience. And what was even more challenging are the veridical, verified veridical perception. When the brain is not working, the person claims, oh, I'm, for example, at this paper, at the last, there is a very famous case uh, <clears throat> in which the person arrived in, in cardiac arrest for many minutes. It was completely uh, in coma, unconscious, with fixed pupils. Even the brain stem reflex were not working. But the person saw himself uh, out of the body, seeing for the ceiling what is happening. He was able to describe the conversation where they, that they took their dentures, that they put the denture in, 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 a, in, in a specific drawer and, and things like that. So uh, it's not expected in a, such kind of cardiac arrest the person could have this experience. So it's, it's strongly suggested that the mind is beyond the brain. Okay? Now, Moving to the second, of course, I, I've, I've been very, very brief in, some, in summarizing this. For those who'd like to, to see more details, we have here some reference and also in the book, of course, uh, you have much more details. Regarding mediumship, mediums claim to have the ability to perceive and communicate or be under the control of deceased persons. We know it's widespread uh, throughout cultures and ages also. And just to give an example about Chico Xavier, yeah, a famous Brazilian medium uh, who published more than 400 books uh, through automatic writing uh, in mediumistic writing, but he also published thousands of letters a tribute to deceased uh, uh, people. And we published some studies of these letters. For example, this is a case, this, it was published uh, some years ago, of an engineering student who died drowned. And then um, a few weeks later, the family visited Chico Xavier and they received the first letter. And the sister of the, the deceased uh, student said that she only told Chico that she had lost a brother and that she was devastated. Despite that, the letter brought a whole range of evidence, not only about the names of several uh, relatives, for example, the grandpa Basso. Basso is not a common name in Brazil, for example. And also the Aunt Elvira, also not a common name uh, in Brazil. He described how he died. And also he, for example, gave some uh, very personal details 
for example, about the keys. He talked about the everyday keys. He was very famous uh, among his close friends for like for liking kiss very much it's always kissing everybody it was very it was very a mark of him so this is also contained in the letter okay and also uh he produced other late other letters later and these letters provided many specific information from the childhood for example one when, when they visited a cave in the interior of minas gerais state for example when he made the reference for example that his father uh, was uh, having suicidal thoughts and that he used to visit every day the cemetery but no one knew that so uh, and uh, so many specific very specific and precise information so he showed the continuity of memory the continuity of personality of traits and even uh so this is one example just to give you uh, uh to show you in total uh we we can see that um, more than 90 items of information were informed in 13 letters okay and uh this uh this level of information uh no, let me move to this other 71 percent of uh items of information that were not communicated to chico xavier and those uh clear and precise fit were 97 percent so a very high level of precision in the information we also published another study investigating another case uh, another letter from Chico Xavier in a psychiatric journal for those who'd like to go further and investigate even more. This is just an example, but there are this is an example of in-depth qualitative study, but there are also controlled quantitative studies. So it has been recently published a meta-analysis of 18 controlled blind experiments uh, where there is strict control of information leakage that the um the sitter, the, 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 the deceased relative, has no contact with the medium and no information is passed through the medium. And also, the sitter needs to score uh, communication, mediumist communication, in a blind way. He, they receive uh, the communication that were targeted to them, but they also received control communications paired by gender and age. And then they need to score and to choose to pick which of these communications is for themselves to exclude just uh, uh, personal tendencies and so on and so forth. And using all these controls, uh, these 18 studies showed that uh, uh, the, the sitter would score higher or pick much more likely their intended communication, the mediumistic reading, than uh, the control ones. So it shows that it's much above chance. So, of course, there are alternative explanations like fraud, over-endorsement of the reading, and coincidence. However, uh, they cannot explain in these controlled studies. And finally, the last sort of evidence are claimed past life memories. We just published also a review paper of the subject. There has been documented the more than 2,000 uh re cases of reincarnation type on average uh, and the, the most important research center in this area is the university of department of psychiatry at university of virginia united states uh, we also in brazil now we are currently uh, running a study in this uh topic also so you know, on average um Children start to talk about their previous life as soon as they start, they are able to talk about two, three years old. And quite often they make accurate memories about previous life. It's possible to find a personality that fits it. And uh, quite often they have birthmarks and birth defects consistent with injuries suffered in the, pre in the alleged previous personality. It's also very interesting. They quite often have emotional reactions and symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorders coincident with the mode of death in alleged previous life. 
okay? And in different cultures, they have uh, these similarities. So this is just a case from Erlen Duharaldson, who was professor of psychology at Iceland University. He graciously uh, allowed us to present this case of Purnima, for example. Purnima, when she was three years old, she started talking about a previous life, okay? She said that she lived in the in the in the Ango, near the Angoda temple, okay, in Kelania, and she said that she was made ambiga and gita picha incense sticks. She was selling incense sticks on a bicycle. She had an accident with a big vehicle, and then she was there. And she also brought the name bring, brought the name of several relatives. So uh, it was investigated. The Kelana Temple is a, a, a famous temple. In, in the region, in Sri Lanka. And actually, they were able to find a incense maker who actually lost a brother who was also an incense maker of the brands Ambiga and Gita Pitch. These brands were not common where Purnima lived, lives. And uh, actually, this brother was selling, was going to sell incense sticks, riding a bicycle, and suffered an accident with a truck and died. Okay, so many other, and also she had uh, these birthmarks. Okay, in the chest, and it it is very in the same in, in the same region of the lesion. This is has a post mortem report. Okay, it was fractures of the ribs that preferred the liver and the spleen exactly in the same region that she has a birthmark. So these are some examples. This is one example of many uh, hundreds and even thousands of studies uh, of cases of reincarnation type. Okay, so uh, she made 20 statements, 14 was correct, three incorrect, and three indeterminate. indeterminate. And we can see then this correct were very specific statements and were not uh, such very general statements that would fit anyone. So moving to the end. Important in science that there is no definitive proof of anything. We don't have definite proof of gravity, for example. We don't have pro definitive proof of evolution, so on and so forth. What we have is the accumulation of different sorts of evidence pointing to a specific conclusion. This is how science works. And exactly what you need to do here is to weight the whole body of evidence. Okay? And the alternative explanations for this evidence, that the sort of evidence that we have discussed here, is fraud, is chance, unconscious activity, or other conventional source, and there is also a more living agent sign or extrasensorial perception. That is actually the main challenge to survive in hypothesis. For example, the telepathy, clairvoyance would, would explain this, okay? However, extrasensorial perception for this case, or living agent side, would require assuming simultaneously very unlikely situations. For example, they should have at much higher levels of uh, sight, skills that these individuals show in their daily lives and also uh, that has been showed in other studies. Also, uh, it would need to, ask, to assume um, uh, a, a series of very unlikely um, assumptions that is very not uh, likely to, to, to happen. Unfortunately, my, my time is... is Close is ending, so I need to skip this. But the point is, there is a compelling case for triangulation. We are convert there is converging evidence from different researchers, dozens of researchers from a broad variety of research groups throughout the, the the world and methods. Also, investigate a wide range of phenomena. All these investigations mutually reinforce each other, pointing to the same conclusion: survival of consciousness. For each piece of evidence. There is an unlikely explanation of undetected fraud, chance, cryptomnesia, or living agent side. However, to multiply dozens of times the concession of these unlikely possibilities 
to be able to explain the whole body of evidence is very, very unlikely. So this is, these are some examples of very strong and good evidence suggesting converging to the survival hypothesis. And in addition, uh, the survival hypothesis has the virtues desirable in a good scientific hypothesis. It, is, it has empirical adequacy, so the empirical consequences of them are true. It's a very broad scope, predicts new kind of phenomena like post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. It's much more, it's much simpler than other explanations. And uh, the conclusion is exactly that the conversion conversions of the diversified and robust body of evidence of the persistence after death of the memory and character that make up our personal identity. In different cultures, most of the investigators who did in-depth in investigation of these studies concluded also in the same um, in the same line. So basically, uh, we, we conclude that survival is the most simple, comprehensive, and natural explanation for the empirical data discussed here in this presentation. Okay. For those who'd like to know more, here is the book. Also, we have a YouTube channel, TV Nupes, at YouTube uh, on science and spirituality that's bilingual in Portuguese and English. So for those who'd like to go further, there are many more things there. And then finally, here are my contacts. If you'd like to be in touch, it would be a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Alexander. Thank you for showing us the much needed evidence for uh, life beyond death and reincarnation. That's great. 